Good morning. So we are in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 15 through 20. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. And says this, he, well, let me, let me read from, uh, yes, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether uh, things on earth or things in heaven. If you just walked in, we are in first, um, Colossians uh, 1, verses 15 through 20. So throughout history, we have had, there have been many men who have achieved worldwide recognition for different reasons, their creativity, their achievements, their contributions to the world. And some of those names today, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Michael Dell, Steve Jobs, uh, Elon Musk and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Those are all well known to all of us. They are famous because they turned a very small business, some of them from their garages, into a multi-billion corporation. So in business, I understand they call people like this, like, like heavy producers, they call them rainmakers. And something that these people, these men have in common besides turning these uh, small business ventures in massive corporations, is that they are, or were at some point, um, the leaders of their own corporations. They, they owned it, and then they, they let them. So these positions uh, gave them the ability and the power to decide the identity that these companies would take, the direction and the mission of the whole enterprise, and of course, they had control over all the resources, whether it was economic or human, whatever. They had control over the company. And no one would have a problem with that, of course, because after all, these men uh, build those corporations from the ground, and it is not unreasonable to expect that uh, these men have control over what they build, over what they own, what they established. And you know, they had an idea, they made an investment, they took some risk, and now they're just enjoying the fruits of their labor. It's only natural that they would be in control. They, they, they own the thing. So their success has brought these men prestige, it has brought them money, power, and fame. I mean, we all know who they are, we all know what they have, so, so I'm, it's just a fact. So these people are the envy, envy of, of millions. I mean, lots of us would like to be like them, right? And another thing that these men have in common is that it is virtually impossible to reach them. So unless you have something that they really want, a common person like us here today uh, cannot just pick up the phone and, and, and connect with this person. We cannot just send them a text and he'll respond or send an email. That, that, that's not the way this works. Uh, you would probably have to go through a thousand people before you even reach his secretary. So in most cases, even if you are a part of the corporation, even if you are employed by these people, you don't have free and unrestricted unrestric access to these men. So if you're in need of a charitable contribution to pay for your bunion sur surgery, you have to go look elsewhere. These people are unreachable. They won't help you. You need to work on having better business connections. But today, I want you to talk, I want to talk to you about a, a, another man. And, and this man is also very famous. However, he is infinitely powerful. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, 
of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God, to the glory of God the Father. This is the man that I want to talk to you about. Despite being uh, uh, highly exalted by God, he is not out of reach. In fact, he is here right now among us. He dwells inside of us through his spirit. He is aware and intimately involved in every aspect of our lives and in every aspect of creation. He knows our hearts. He sees our thoughts. He hears our prayers. And of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. This is the man that I want to talk to you about. He is infinitely powerful, and he's never, without, uh, never away from our reach. So in this lesson, we have two parts. The first is verses 15 through 17, where we will see that Christ is the Lord of the first creation. And in the second part, we're going to see that verses 20, uh, 18 to 20, uh, the Lord is the Lord of new creation. So let's begin with the first creation in verse 15. Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What we have here in this verse are two very powerful statements about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first statement, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. All of us here know that God is a spirit and he cannot be seen, he doesn't have a body. But Paul tells us here that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, most of our English Bibles translate the Greek word akon as image. image. However, uh, I think that a more precise translation uh, would be living image. So the verse would say something like, he is the living image of God. Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. The point here that Paul is making is that in Christ, the invisible God has been made visible. In Christ, God revealed himself in such a way that we can actually see him either, even in our finitude. God is infinite. We cannot comprehend him. If, if we could, he wouldn't be God. So he's infinite, we're finite, we cannot comprehend God, but, but Jesus has actually made him seen to us. So this, without question, is an explicit declaration about the deity of Christ. Why? Well, because the implication is that Jesus shares the same substance, the same nature, the same power, and the same character of God. Jesus Christ possesses all of God's divine attributes. So in his humanity, Jesus bears the image of Adam, and in his divinity, Jesus bears the image of God. So Jesus is the exact portrait of God. He is the full, final, and complete revelation of God. That is a massive statement that Paul is making here. It has tremendous implications. It has eternal implications for all of us here today. Now, in the second statement, of verse 15, Paul says that Jesus Christ is also the firstborn of all creation. So at first glance, without really knowing what's happening here, uh, one might think that the word firstborn, firstborn suggests that Jesus Christ had a beginning, that there was a time when he was not, that there was a time when, when Christ did not exist at all. And in fact, this is exactly how Arius interpreted this passage back in the fourth century. Arius was a preacher from Alexandria who, uh, in his attempt to defend the church from the charge of polytheism, of the Trinity, that the, the people could not understand or could not believe that, that uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were one person with one essence, uh, uh, they, they, they charged the church as being polytheists. So in his attempt to, to defend the church from this uh, uh, charge, Arius denied the eternality of Christ by teaching that Christ was actually a created being. And while Arius did acknowledge that Christ was the highest of, all God, of God's creatures, he still denied that Jesus Christ was a deity. So Arius thought that Jesus was like a, like a created creator. So this is, this is incorrect. This, this was a heresy, and this was, in fact, condemned by the church 
in AD 325. However, even though this teaching was condemned so many years ago, it's still alive and well with us today through the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses who, who, who truly think that Jesus had a beginning, that he is a created being. But Christ is not a created being. That's what Paul is telling us here. He does not have a birth or an origin because he has always existed. He is eternal. The Greek word for firstborn, which is prototokos, uh, appears 130 times in the Septuagint, and it is usually used in reference to birth order. It means primogeniture. Right, the firstborn, that's what it means. However, in this context, this word of firstborn expresses a special relationship with the father. It is a position of privilege. So it's a position of privilege before God. And, and we see an example of how this word is used in Psalm 89, verse 27, where God calls David his firstborn among the kings of the earth. So what Paul is telling us here when he says that, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation, he means that Jesus is prior and sovereign over all creation. Therefore, in this verse, the point is this. Jesus is preeminent. He is supreme and he's sovereign over all creation. That's what Paul is telling us in this verse. He's speaking about Jesus' preeminence He's speaking about his sovereignty over all creation. There is no one like him. So this is, this, is when, this is when we see how great is Christ. Christ is not like us. Christ is not like us at all. Then in verse 16, Paul gives evidence to support this assertion that he just made. So verse 16 says, for in him all things were created all things have been created through him and for him. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. In my Bible, it says, for by him. Uh, the conjunction is different, but the, the, the conjunction, n, is usually or most commonly translated as in, and that's the way I am taking it. I think it makes more sense to translate, for in him, all things were created. So. Here we have three prepositional phrases that express three different ideas about Christ. So the first prepositional phrase is found at the beginning of the verse, in him all things were created. So this phrase tells us that Christ is the sphere in which everything exists. All of creation exists in him. It also tells us that Christ is the source of all things. So in other words, Christ is the architect. He is the designer of everything that exists, both in the heavens and in the earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all of it. He is the source of all of these things. All of these things that were just mentioned exist in Christ. And here we need to make a quick note because they're speaking about thrones or dominions, rulers and authorities. And let me, let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, the consensus among theologians is that thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities refer, of course, to spiritual beings. And in general, these, these, these uh, terms are used to describe good spiritual uh, uh, beings like, um, like angels, like the different ranks of angels. However, in Ephesians 6, uh, these nouns can also refer to spiritual forces of wickedness like fallen angels. So unfortunately, in our text, there's not enough evidence to determine whether these spirits are, are good or bad. They are most likely bad, but we cannot determine that for sure, I don't think. So the, that's not the point. The point here is that all things in all places owe their existence to Christ. So it doesn't matter what or, or, or who they are. It doesn't matter where they are. All things, all powers, visible and invisible, friendly or hostile, absolutely everything owes its existence to Christ. They are originated in Christ. So Christ is the master of creation. Therefore, everything that exists is subject, it, it, it's subservient to Christ 
and it's impotent against his power. So you see, we're escalating in, 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 in the magnitude of the, of the person of Christ. He's the creator. He's master of everything. He has power and sovereignty over everything. No one has power over him. If we were going back to the example of these powerful men that I just spoke about, they have certain power within their companies. They build them to, from the ground. But some of them now, today, they have to go to the board of trustees or whatever board that they have. And the board might be actually able to just kick them out from the company, which has happened you know, in other places. That's not the, the, the case with the Lord. The Lord is sovereign. There's no one that can come and correct him. There's no one that can overpower him. That's what we have here. He has infinite power, and we're impotent against him. The second prepositional phrase comes toward the end of the verse, and it says that all things have been created through him. In other words, all of creation came to be through the power and the ability of Christ. So Christ is not only the source and the architect of all things, he's also the agent of all creation. He is the builder. He made the plans. He drew the plans. He made all the arrangements for this to happen, and, and he's also the one who made it happen. Paul then concludes verse 16 with a third propositional phrase saying, all things have been created for him. So all creation exists to display the glory of Christ. And ultimately, Christ is going to be glorified by his creation. So Jesus Christ is the central point of all creation. And he rules over all of it. Then... In verse 17, Paul makes two statements that serve as a summary of what he just said in the previous verses. So first, Paul says that he is before all things. So this statement reinforces what was already said in verse 15, that Christ is the firstborn over all creation. In other words, before the universe began, before there was anything at all, Christ was already there. Remember, in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All right, Jesus was already there. Jesus Christ was already there. He was there before there was anything else. Why? Because He is eternal. He is before all things. And that is what makes Him preeminent over all creation. So Paul concludes this summary by saying that in Him all things hold together. So Christ is not also the architect and the builder of all creation. He is also the sustainer of creation. He holds all things together. When you look at science, when you look at nature, you can just wonder, how is it that we just don't shoot out of the, out of the planet? How is it that we are all kept here and we just fly into outer space? Well, here's the answer. Christ keeps the stars shining. He keeps the planets moving. He, lives, he, he keeps the lives thriving and our hearts beating. He's in control of everything. He sustains the universe and everything in it. So the universe and all of us who exist in it, we owe our existence, our coherence, our continuance to Christ. We're absolutely dependent on the Lord. Whether we acknowledge him or not, whether we believe that he is or not, that is irrelevant. He doesn't need us to believe it. He still does it, which is a miracle. So God is the only and one and only source of life. Only God has the ability to design and the power to create and the mercy and grace to take care of his creation. So, if Jesus Christ is preeminent, supreme, and sovereign over all creation, is because he is God incarnate. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the first creation because he is God himself. That's what we, that's where we arrive to. That, that, that's, the, that's what Paul is telling us. Now at this point, Paul makes a transition. He moves now from the general, speaking about the whole cosmos, the whole universe, and everything in it, 
So that's the general, and now he moves to the particular. And then in the, in, uh, in the previous verses, we saw the general, and now the particular is going to speak about um, our personal salvation. He's going to be the redeemer. He's going to talk about us now. Now we're going to leave everything in the magnitude of the universe, and we're going to focus on, on us, on us here on earth. So now we're going to see how the Lord is, is Lord of the new creation as well. So Paul begins in verse 18, saying that Christ is also head of the body, the church. When you read the letters of Paul, he often describes the church as the body of Christ. And he does so because the church consists of all of those who belong to Christ. In other words, the church is composed by all of those who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. The Nicene Creed, I believe, it says, speaks about the Catholic Church. When, 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 when the creeds speak about the Catholic, Catholic Church, means the church universal, the church everywhere, the body of believers everywhere, no matter where they are. It's not Roman Catholic. That's what we see here. The church is the, is the Catholic Church is the whole body of believers, regardless of where they worship. They may be a believer's chapel. They may be at First Baptist. They may be at First whatever. It's the believers that are everywhere, no matter where they are. So when Paul speaks about the church or the body of Christ, he's referring, as I was saying, to Christians in all parts of the world. Now, the church is called the body of Christ for a very simple reason. It belongs to Christ. And it belongs to Christ because he purchased it, purchased it with his blood. Therefore, Christ has ownership, authority, and control over his church. He has control over his body. Just as a physical body has a head that governs it physically, Christ governs the church spiritually. Going back to the example that I had at the beginning, these men build a church, I mean, no, not the church, their, uh, their companies, with their resources, and they control it because they own it. It is natural, it is expected. So the same thing we have with the Lord. He is the maker, he's the designer, he's the sustainer, so he owns it. That's what it is. The body and the head are inseparable, right? If you have a body, it needs a head, and your head needs the body. So they are both inseparable, and if you uh, separate them, they both die. Well, here, we are inseparable, the body and, and, and the head. However, the body and the head are not the same. We, as the body, we identify with Christ. We find our identity in him but he doesn't find his identity in us. He's eternal, he existed before we did, he doesn't need us to survive, we do. So that's why the body and the head are not the same. He is self-sufficient, we are not. He doesn't need anything or anyone to exist, we need him to exist. So we are finite members of the body, he is infinite. That's the difference between both of us, and yet we are inseparable. That's another miracle. So, Paul tells us that the reason why Christ is the head of the church is because he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So, we already established that our Savior is preeminent. He is the source. He is the originator of the, uh, of the church. And now we see that Christ is the firstborn from the dead because he is the first and, in fact, the only one to break the power of death. His resurrection signifies his triumph over sin and death, which was holding man in bondage. And while it is true that in Scripture we see that others have been brought back to life, like the very famous Lazarus, none of them received a glorified body. Lazarus was raised from the dead, and eventually he died again. Jesus came back from the dead, and he's still alive in a glorified body at the right hand of the Father in heaven. 
So Jesus Christ is the only resurrected man who has received a glorified body so far. Our hope is that all of us here at some, part, uh, um, at some point will do the same thing. So Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection not only brought new life to those who believe in him, it also confirmed that Christ is preeminent in everything. Everything. Then, in verse 19, Paul sums up his argument saying, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Paul may have made this statement in order to address a heresy that was running around Colossae that taught that Jesus was not divine, that he was not God. And, and, and this, um, this heretic teaching taught that Jesus was one of many emanations of God, that he had several angelic beings or, or spiritual beings coming out of, 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 of God that served as mediators between men and God. So, um, this is kind of similar, not, not quite, but it's kind of similar what you would have in the Roman Catholic Church where there are people that think that you need to pray to Mary so that she can intercede for you before Christ because you don't just approach Christ because he's, you know, exalted. So you have to go through a saint or in this case through Mary so that they can just go and talk to Christ on your behalf. That's not how this works. Paul refutes that teaching in this verse by saying that Jesus is completely God. All the divine essence, powers, and attributes reside in Jesus Christ. Everything that God is, Jesus Christ is. Jesus then is the only mediator between God and man. We need no one else. That's another difference with the men that I gave you at the beginning. If you want to speak to the big guy in Amazon, you need to go through an army of subordinates and maybe, maybe you will reach the assistant. But if you want to talk to the person who's in charge of all creation, you just need to speak. You just need to address him, Lord, I need you. And he hears and he responds. One thing that must be pointed out is that Paul is not saying here that Jesus was a man that was elevated to deity like the Mormons believe. Jesus was not a man that became a God. Not at all. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is actually saying is that God was pleased to take human form in Jesus. Jesus, as I said before, is God incarnate, and he possesses all saving power and grace. He's the only mediator between God and man. There is no one else. We don't need anyone else. And through him, he has reconciled all things to himself, verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Here we have this term reconciliation. And when you talk about reconciliation, you presuppose that there is a conflict, that something has gone wrong, it presupposes the existence of a hostility. That's why there needs to be a reconciliation. So for example, when a husband, and I'm sure that no one of you knows anything about this, when a husband and a wife change from being in conflict with each other for not doing what needed to be done in the garage, and when they come back together and they change from being in conflict to being in peace, it is said to be reconciled, right? Now you are happy with each other, you're not quarreling, now you have been reconciled, we're, we're back in peace. So here, when the Bible speaks of reconciliation, it refers to the restoration of a right relationship between God and man. Now, if you have never heard the gospel, you need to know that, that this is actually true. There is a conflict between man and God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, when God had finished all his work of creation, he saw that all that he had made was very good. Everything in the universe was exactly how God intended it to be. God walked with Adam in the garden, and they had fellowship with one another. There was peace and harmony through all creation. No problems. Everything was perfect. Unfortunately, in Genesis 3, we see that when Adam ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, sin and death 
entered into the world, affecting not only the human race, but all of creation. Everything was affected by sin, and now everything dies. So Adam's sin immediately, instantly, transformed our fellowship with God into enmity with God. Our sin also brought suffering and chaos to all of creation. In a blink of an eye, we went from peace into conflict due to sin. So the effects of this sin can be seen in space when, let's say, for example, that a star turns into a supernova, or when a black hole swallows everything around it, or when an asteroid collides against the planet and, and, and destroys it or, or moves them out of its orbit. There, there's, there's chaos in, in, in space. And then on Earth, we see violent and destructive power of, of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes like, like the one you just had in, in, in Turkey, tornadoes, hurricanes, to, to just mention a few. And individually and collectively, we suffer physically and mentally through different afflictions and diseases. And after the fall, as I was saying, everything decays and ultimately dies. Creation is suffering due to our sin. But Christ brought peace order and harmony into what is otherwise chaotic and distorted. Through his death on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty of our sin and satisfied the justice of God. Christ has then now reconciled us with the Father. He restored our relationship with God. Man is now forgiven, and the curse that affects creation right now will at some point be removed when the Lord comes back and he recreates the heavens and the earth, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and none of this is going to be in this array anymore. That's what Christ did. That's what Christ will do. He has brought us back with the Father. We are not enemies anymore. We are children of God by adoption. All of it because of Christ did for us at the cross. Now, for centuries, Many scientists have been fascinated by the secrets of the universe, and probably maybe all of us here. On July 12 of 2022, NASA released the first full-color image taken by the James Webb Telescope, which is replacing the Hubble. And these images, if you have not seen them, these are breathtaking. Thousands and thousands of these little bright spots with different shapes and different colors and sizes all over a black canvas. And each one of those spots represents a different galaxy with their own stars and planets and whatever else is there in these galaxies. So trillions and trillions of mile away, miles away from Earth are these little spots. And then, as a believer, you cannot help but to think this beauty that we have in front of our eyes completely corroborates what Psalm 19 verses 1 through 4 says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God revealed himself through nature. When we observed all the beauty that surrounds us, whether in earth or in space, when we analyze the complexity and the balance that make life possible, we cannot help but to wonder who is responsible for all this. Who made these things to come alive? Who created all this? How did this came to be? And our text here provides us with the answer. The Lord Jesus Christ says, it is me. I did. All of it is my idea. I brought it into being. I created it. So I am the source. I am the designer. I am the builder and sustainer of everything that exists. Even you. Even you here today. I am the one. I thought about you, and I made you. And I'm thinking about you right now, and I'm keeping you alive. And I hear you, and I am with you, and I am guiding you, and I am protecting you. You are mine, and one day I will bring you to me, but not today. 
Unfortunately, many lives have been wasted looking for answers in places other than God and his written word, which is the Bible. And in their rebellion against God, these people have found it better to believe in pure luck and random things rather than taking God at his word. And if you think about it, this is just as absurd as to believe that given the appropriate time and conditions, you can leave a Lego set somewhere, and then after um, a, a, a period of time and under certain conditions, the Lego set is going to assemble itself in the correct order and in the appropriate shape. Think about it, and it, it is absurd. But there are people that, that believe this, that this is possible. Now, it might, they not believe it of the Lego, but they believe it of creation, which is equally absurd. So people refuse to believe that Jesus is who he says he is because they don't want to be held accountable by him. So if you're here without Christ, you're in grave danger. You are an enemy of God deserving of his wrath, and you're a sinner incapable of paying over your own sin and incapable of achieving reconciliation with God. And as I said, whether you acknowledge it or not, believe it or not, you're still the enemy under his wrath, and you will pay. You will pay for this. All of us, we will have to march before the white throne of the Father to be judged and sentenced for what we did. And that day when we go in front of the throne, all of us are going to be declared guilty. But the difference is that those who are in Christ will not have to serve the penalty, and they will be showed into heaven. But those who died without Christ will have to pay for their own, or their own sin, and they will be led to the lake of fire. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. If you're here without Christ, your soul is in danger. But if you turn to him, you will have life. You will have forgiveness for your sins. And all you need to do is to believe in him. Just come to him. He will receive you with open arms. And for the rest of us who are here, redeemed and saved, a passage like this can only increase our admiration and worship for the Lord, for who he is, an infinite God that took the shape of man, not the shape, he took, the, 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 took flesh, he became man, he is the God-man to redeem his elect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for this text that speaks about your son and who he is, what he has done, and uh, Lord, we, we have no words to express our gratitude and our amazement at what you have done through your Son and through your Spirit. So Lord, we ask you that you would allow us to uh, acknowledge who you are and worship you accordingly. Lord, we ask that if there's anyone here that has not yet trusted you, that you would make him yours, that you would touch their hearts and give them a heart of flesh, that they may be able to, to trust the Savior for the uh, forgiveness of their sins and um, eternal life. Uh, Lord, we lift up all of those who are suffering, who are sick, who are um, in any kind of difficulty, Lord. We know that you know who they are, and yet we, we, we lift up our voices to intercede on their behalf. Lord, would you please be with all of them, be with Stanton as he's still in the hospital, be with the Newmans as they need encouragement, uh, with the Webs and, and, and everybody else. Lord, you know who they are, you know what they need, so Lord, would you please, um, Give comfort, peace, healing, wherever it's needed, Lord. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in his name we pray. Amen.